Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the ZOA Book Club. Uh, today, we're very honored to have uh, my friend uh, Yisrael HaKohen speaking about his uh, beloved father's book. Um, I'm going to hold it up. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, Homeland from Clandestine Immigration to Israeli Independence. Um, I was fortunate enough to hear many of the stories in this book uh, directly from, um, from Dr. Mordecai Hakoen uh, when I had uh, dinner over at the Hakoen family, and I'm really excited to hear Yisrael speak about this. Um, and with uh, that, I, will, I am very pleased to uh, turn this over to uh, Yisrael Hakoen. Yisrael, please go ahead. Thanks. Hey, thank you. First, I want to express my appreciation to the Zionist Organization of America's Book Club and to Liz and to Alan um, for the opportunity to discuss my father's memoirs and also reflect on his life. Can everybody hear me? Am I coming across okay? Yeah. Fine. Good. good. Okay. Often readers like to know a little more about the background of the author of a book. So it's what you find in the back of uh, flap. So one of my goals is to give you a little bit of a run up to how the book finally did get written and um, add some of observations about my dad and things that I learned from his achievements. Um, my, when I, as, as Linz mentioned, my parents very often had guests over for meals and for conversation. And when I was uh, growing up, I didn't initially appreciate the who the participants of, of these intriguing conversations about um, areas of concern to uh, the Jewish community. I didn't know who they were, and um, and other times I I just was fascinated by the stories of events that they shared, uh, and so. As I got older and I found out a lot, a little more about the folks who were there, I asked my dad to preserve um, these stories in the form of, of a memoir. And he resisted because he didn't want to take time out to look at the past while he had the energy to pursue new projects. And he preferred to look towards the future and determine his priorities for the present. So he just refused to write anything down and to take the time aside to work on the book. Um, fortunately, once he's later on in his life, when his energies were a, little, a bit diminished, Elie Wiesel, a friend of my father's, did prevail on him to uh, record his life's events. And my father having both an excellent memory and a very meticulous uh, filing system finally agreed in his 80s to sit down and commit to writing uh, the events of his life. And um, when I look at them, I am pretty much in awe because my father lived in a period of time which was fast changing and turbulent and very, very um, unpredictable. And um, he found his way to get involved and undertake, sometimes at great personal risk, initiatives that in small measures became game changers. Um, my father had a friend, uh, Professor Israel Elgad, who some might recognize from his Lehi fame. And he used to say, a prophet isn't someone who can tell the future. A prophet is someone who understands the present. And um, very much by understanding the present, you can see where events will lead to and how they will likely unfold. And it's that kind of insight that my father did have, which often placed his thinking ahead of his time. Uh, my father grew up in Vienna, 
uh, his, his upbringing was an interesting combination of religious and nationalist. Um, religious in the sense that his family was observant and followed, uh, although in a more modern way, the teachings of the Hasidim of Chodkov. And, uh, and then as far as his Zionism, that basically uh, evolved by his witnessing violent anti-Semitism in Vienna and seeing how Jabotinsky's disciples in the Beitar youth movement uh, took it upon themselves to combat the thugs who were beating Jews up and uh, we, inspired by this bravery. Uh, my father was attracted to learn more about the movement and join it. And these two uh, currents of uh, love for Jewish tradition and uh, lifestyle on the one hand and national pride and, um, and, uh, and courage on the other uh, really came, uh, came to inform his choices in life. Um, for those who've had a chance to go through the book, uh, my father witnessed a Jewish student being thrown out of the window of the University of Vienna. And although the Jewish community protested to the municipality about this campus violence, at the time, the police were not allowed to enter the university. And so this could, was continuing uh, regularly. And uh, at, until having the regular appeals having failed, a group of followers of Jabotinsky lined the entrance to the university with, um, with bats and basically beat up those students who came in wearing swastikas. And when those students were being hospitalized, the Vienna Council met and decided to change the regulations and allow police to patrol the university and ensure student safety. And this event inspired my father to join and participate in the leadership training programs, the Jewish history programs, the self-defense programs, and learn about a Jewish history from a very, very um, positive and uh, affirming way. Our people have a tradition of 3,500 years, tying us to our land and our belief system. And part of the Beitar education was to uh, be conversant with it, with our history, and also with our language and encourage the uh, speaking of Hebrew. Um, when the Nazis entered Vienna in, uh, uh, during the Anschluss in March of 1938, uh, a group of Jews saw how the Nazis were rounding up uh, Jewish uh, Jews and imprisoning them just before Passover. And there was a fellow in the Aguda named Wolf Pappenheim who agreed to finance uh, the provision of kosher food, the providing of kosher food to the 19 prisons in Vienna. Um, and my father volunteered to make those deliveries. And so he would go uh, in a in a vehicle driven by an Aryan driver bearing a Nazi flag on it into the prisons, go through the front entrance after it was closed, get admitted through the second entrance. It was a Sally port system. And then he would unload the boxes and go back and refill for the next visit. And uh, his, he, I remember him telling me the hardest place to stop was the youth prison because the kids who were wandering around there were his age. And in essence, if not the grace of God, he would have been in there with them. And it was also very uncertain that they would let him out, but he did make those deliveries. And um, he felt, you know, he felt that this movement 
and he took great pride in the fact that it felt responsible for the community and met their needs. Um, another aspect of, uh, of his involvement with Beitar was his selection by Otto Zeidman, who was the head of Beitar in Vienna, uh, who chose my father as a teenager to coordinate the, um, the beginnings of the, what was later called the clandestine immigration to Israel. People, Jews were beginning to realize that the gates to Israel were closed by the British. And so um, the le le leaders who were following events wanted to find an alternate route of bringing Jews to Israel. And they felt that the sea was an option. So a fellow named um, Galili had an idea which he piloted um, by sending several small vessels with Jewish kids to Israel, successfully evading the British blockade. And my father was asked to get the word out in Vienna and organize the transport of uh, Jews from uh, Europe to Israel using uh, Greek vessels that uh, the revisionists had hired uh, to do the actual transport. And um, my father led such a group in addition to organizing several others. Uh, as you probably read in the book, his transport was stopped at the Italian border because it turned out that the boat that was originally hired was actually non-existent and the uh, community was defrauded. And so Eichmann, who didn't want the Jews to leave in the first place, had the train on a sidetrack for two weeks and then returned to Vienna. Uh, my father made arrangements in Vienna to reabsorb the group, house them in community in the community center and dispatch them uh, on the Danube, which was international waters to, meet, to get to another boat in Italy. And then he was instructed to fly to um, to, to uh, Fiume to um, pick up the, the balance of the group that, was, that made it from other European nations for the journey to Israel. In the interim, they had secured another boat called the Draga One. Uh, the Draga made the voyage. Uh, when they were rounding Athens, uh, the crew mute, not, uh, called a strike. They wanted higher wages. There was a lot of tension till um, negotiations were concluded and the trip continued and the boat was um, safely brought into Israel on Kol Nidre night, 1938. So um, my father uh, reached the shores at that point. His colleague on the boat was a fellow named Shmuel Degansky, whose nickname was Johnny. And there was another fellow who uh, served as the, um, on, on the upper deck watching the captain uh, who was trained in the Beitar uh, Naval Academy. And European Jews on the whole were very, very uncomfortable with a lot of this activity because they felt, what are Jews setting up a Naval Academy for? And this was a very, very wise um, decision with a lot of foresight because the graduates of these programs served to supervise the illegal boats to ensure that they were in fact heading to Israel and not being diverted to other locations. Um, with the boat arriving in Israel, there was a group to welcome the Jews on shore and disperse them among the population. And uh, my father went about bringing his parents legally, uh, quote, legally, uh, through British, through the regular British um, that visa system. He himself was too proud to 
come that way, although his uncle who was in Israel sent him visas because my father felt as a proud Jew that the British had no authority to admit Jews or refuse Jews to Israel. And on principle, he wanted to save others and bypass that, um, with that, uh, that practice. Anyway, my father uh, joined the Irgun when he was in uh, Israel uh, and began his studies at Hebrew University. Uh, for a while, he had a side business selling textiles and feathers to support his parents who were elderly. And um, the war broke out. When the war broke out, my father was in Jerusalem. At the time of the siege, he and uh, another man, uh, Mark Aviezer, took the initiative uh, and began a census of people living in apartment buildings so that, God forbid, when an explosion would occur, the rescue groups would know who would, how many people to look for and uh, who they were looking for. Um, this was coordinated and supervised by a professor, Italian origin uh, from the Hebrew University, who himself was killed standing guard in front of the Orient Theater in Jerusalem. Um, this Mark Aviezer was one of the guests whose name appeared in the guest book and whom I remember very fondly visiting quite often at my parents' home. Um, my father studied political science at the Hebrew University. However, when he heard about an opportunity to study public administration, uh, he applied to the, to the program that was initiated by Viscount, Her well, at that time, Herbert Samuel, um, sorry, Edwin Samuel, Herbert Samuel's son. Um, and Edwin Samuel was a very fascinating individual in his own right. He was uh, brought up in England. He was very familiar with the Israeli, with the British military system, as well as government. And, he, and Abba Ibn, who was one of his colleagues, uh, set up this program for teaching future civil servants and public administrators for the future government of Israel. The notion that when you have a country after 2000 years, you need to have people who are familiar with how to operate one. And, um, and that's, that was, my father was involved in getting that program off the ground. First, he entered as a student and he was invited to as well be part of the administration of the program. Um, when parts of the city fell to the Arabs, the uh, library of this institution um, was transferred to a safe zone by my father who snuck the books over. Um, in, a, in an interesting operation described in the book. Um, when, after the War of Independence, Ben-Gurion invited my father to be part of a committee for uh, supervising the government structures. And my father also was hired by Walter Eitan um, in the foreign ministry to set up the first 46 legations and embassies, as well as to uh, recruit the personnel and write the procedural manuals for those embassies. Um, there was a fellow from Vienna who identified my father as having been a follower of Jabotinsky. And the nature of the time was that there was a tremendous amount of polarization in Israel, not unlike what we see today in America and in other places in the world. And if you weren't part of the right political party, your future was definitely um, at risk. Uh, my father noticed that the Mapai party was holding party, uh, partisan pol political events in, on government facilities and registered his protest. Uh, he was unhappy with the discriminatory practices against members of, no, not, and who were not uh, of the prevailing Mapai party. And, um, and when a guard 
revealed that my father was a follower of Jabotinsky. My father was called in and given the choice of either joining the party or told to prepare for some career reassignment, at which point my father decided to leave Israel and return to his studies. He went for his doctorate in New York and um, his thesis was on providing uh, hydroelectric power to the Negev uh, using generators, uh, and, which would be placed on a canal to be built from the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea. This project, Dead Med project, keeps surfacing every decade or so. Israel typically doesn't have the funds for it. But back then, my father was already anticipating the need for hydroelectric power for the country and desalinization of water for irrigation of the Negev, and really a very climate-friendly energy, alternative source of energy. And this is in the early 50s. Um, after he completed his doctoral studies at the New School of Social Research in Columbia, my father was introduced to Isaac Shalom, who I mentioned earlier, and was fascinated by the prospect of setting up Jewish schools in Muslim countries. With an American passport, he had access and frequently visited Iran and Morocco and France, which had housed uh, Sephardic communities that fled from, um, from Algeria and Libya and Lebanon, um, and whose youth were at risk of assimilation. The uh, Otsara Torah Network provided not only religious studies, but also technical studies in cooperation with ORT um, so that the students had a half day of Jewish studies, a half a day of vocational and secular studies. And of the over 24,000 students who went through the system, I have on many occasions met either family members or students themselves who had been through the program and credited it with being a key turning point in their life. Um, my father worked with Otsara Torah until 1966. At that point, um, he decided to switch careers to allow him to be closer to home. And um, my father joined a, a American bank and trust company and um, continued his communal work uh, through his banking uh, activities. He would use the branches of the bank to showcase the work of Israeli artists. He would be involved in setting up conferences to uh, connect Israeli entrepreneurs with uh, American investors. Um, he would introduce scientists and uh, technology people to funders. And, and he was also very active in helping um, many educational institutions. My father joined the original board of Turo College, who was a big supporter of the Jerusalem College of Technology in Israel, Shari uh, Chesed Hospital. And um, when my father was invited to speak in Switzerland, on one occasion of Friyom um, he was advised by Isaac Shalom that a friend of his, uh, a Mr. Laniato, had recently passed away childless, leaving a fortune of, at the time, a million eight hundred thousand dollars in Swiss accounts. Mr. Laniato was a was was actually Parisian but would visit Switzerland and was never granted uh, residency. He would always have to reapply as a visitor. On hearing that Mr. Laniato was uh, in the hospital, the Swiss decided to uh, grant him residency just before he died so that they could uh, impose a death tax of a million and a half dollars on his estate. And uh, Isaac Shalom felt very upset about this. And so he asked my father if to, to try and intervene. So when my father was invited to speak in front of the community at an Israel Independence Day event, um, he called out the Swiss government for this money grab. 
And part of the day on the dais was a Swiss senator named uh, Mr. Fiss, who was very embarrassed by this greed and worked to change things so that um, only 300,000 of that estate was taken by the Swiss and half a million was then forwarded to each of what became the Laniato Hospital in Netanya, the Parat Yosef Yeshiva in Jerusalem, and the remaining half a million to a girls' school in B'nai Barak. Um, and my father was very pleased to have played the role to bring that change about. Um, in his later years, he was involved in the battle for uh, what do you call it, Hasbara. In uh, during the after following the Six Day War, he went to Washington and met with members of Congress um, to and, and went on a speaking tour to fight the misuse of the terms occupied territory and West Bank and the notion of returning territory. Uh, and instead corrected his former colleagues from Israel's foreign ministry that these terms would come back to haunt us because if Judea and Samaria were not identified as such and, and the areas re uh, captured during the Six Day War were not identified as liberated or at least administered territories, the term occupied with the connotation from the Second World War would indicate that these did not belong to Jews. And indeed today we see the same problem where people challenge whether Jews are the indigenous population of Israel. And this of course is, was contributed by these misconceptions that, um, that we've as a community allowed to, to continue. Um, um, my, uh, as I said, my father spent the latter part of his career in, uh, working to reform Israel's economy and uh, liberalize it so that foreign investment could find its way to what would popularly become the startup nation. When Benjamin Netanyahu was the finance minister and was speaking in New York, he, I, he I noticed my father in the audience and singled him out during his talk as having really been a major contributor to the reform movement, reforming the economic restrictions that were notoriously hurting Israel's economy. And um, finally, he, uh, you know, as, as age caught up with him, he needed to wind down. And so the time was ripe for him to write this book. Um, I think that as American Jews who have grown up in the safety and security here in the United States, it's very hard to imagine the status of European Jews before the war in the sense that they had a horrific experience of persecution and discrimination and so for them to get accepted into society that was um, constantly uh, vilifying them was a big challenge. And by having the positive influences of a Zionist movement that taught Jewish pride and a religious movement that taught uh, love of our fellow man and loving kindness and, and doing random acts of kindness, community kindness. Um, it basically gave my, informed my father's outlook uh, on things that needed to be done. And one of the takeaways I had from him was just because you haven't done it before, doesn't mean you can't do it. And uh, he really applied that in many, many areas. Um, my father was notified by a relative of mine in Israel that a member of his community had a heart issue. My father arranged for this person to be treated by, um, by the teacher of the first heart, of, of 
doctor who conducted the first transplant. Um, my father was a genius at finding networking connections that people just didn't see. You know, but he, he always said that, you know, the way you look at things depends on what you see. And if you want to get something done, you can find a way to do it, often find a way to do it. And uh, when I compare his, his environment of growing up with the kind of antisemitism we find today in the media, in academia, in the government. I mean, we just had that Texas hostage situation and the FBI director says that you can't really attribute it as a hate crime. Uh, and and, and the, this is just really, really very disconcerting, very, very disconcerting. Um, and physical violence against Jews and the silence of a lot of the establishment in tolerating this, um, it's, it, we need, we need a new burst of leadership. We need people with vision. We need a community that will care about each other much more and rest restore civil discourse and conversations. My father used to read newspapers from the left to the right, from the religious to the secular and from countries all around the world. He never relied on his sources of information to be um, you know, based on only one or two sources. And uh, he always respected other people's opinions. And I think that that's something that's sorely lacking today. And I hope that individually our challenge will be to restore that. Um, one of the things that my father pointed out in the book was that he really wanted people to recognize the challenges of the times and to act on them and to feel confident in acting on them because when you step forward, it takes courage, but it also attracts other people who step up to help. And that's really the way things change and improve. Um, so ways my father wanted both to recognize the unsung heroes and the unknown soldiers who, whose efforts really helped establish the state and, um, and who changed to change and improve Jewish life on a daily basis and to encourage others uh, to take up the torch. Anyway, I want I wanted very much to give people a chance to share their thoughts. And so I think I'll pause here and take questions if that would be all right. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much, Yisrael. Um, hold on a second. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating presentation. And um, I think it also shows how important it is for people to to write down their memories of, of their experiences. There's so many people who have made incredible contributions and um, you know, we'd love to feature them also in, in the book club, but you know, it's important for posterity to, to, to um, you know, speak about these events. Um, there were a number of events that, um, you know, that you talk about in the book that, um, you know, I would love, I would love if you could, could tell the stories um, about, but maybe I'll turn to, to, to that later, um, you know, including the, the story of this, the, uh, the, the co-tell, um, blowing the show, trying to blow the show for at the co-tell at the time when the British were arresting people and imprisoning people for doing that. And, uh, also his involvement in Gold of My Year, becoming the ambassador, the Israeli ambassador to Moscow. Uh, another one is this, the, uh, the soccer field, which became an airport in uh, Jerusalem. And I know your father, you know, had interesting things to say about all, all these stories, but. Uh, I'm very proud of you, Liz. You, you really did a thorough job. I had a difficult uh, time mm -hmm. deciding on what to focus on. <laughs> recapping, you know, the book and my dad's um, sort of the other additional things that were left out of it. So oh, oh, well, one other thing that he worked, your dad worked for ZOA's youth, youth department. <laughs> surprised and delighted to find out he was, for a short time, he was the youth director um, before he got accepted to the graduate program. Uh -huh. He didn't get a student visa. But in the interim, he was still able to to uh, arrange some socials and lectures, and I'm very uh -huh. proud of that. Uh -huh. So, um, I mean, 
you know, let me open this up for other questions right now, and then maybe you could go back and speak about some of those wonderful stories. Um, uh, you know, please, if you're interested in asking a question, either put it in the chat or uh, raise your hand on the raise your hand button. Um, let's see. Oh, we have a question from uh, Michael Goodman in the chat. Um, how long was Batar active in Vienna following the Anschluss, if, if you know? I mean, I know you're speaking about your father's experience. You may not know the answers to well, the questions. Um, there were, and that's a very, it get, deserves a very nuanced answer. There were uh, about a dozen and a half branches of Batar across the city. On the evening of the Anschluss, um, members of each of those chapters were instructed to go and clear out all the mem and destroy all the membership files in the offices and to bring the flags to Israel. And if you go to the Je Jabotinsky Institute, Beit Jabotinsky in Tel Aviv, you will see that all 17 flags of Vienna, Beitar, were rescued and found a home there. Um, as far as the activities of the Beitar after the Anschluss, um, I don't really know a lot of details about it. I know that, um, unfortunately, between the British limitations on um, visas to Israel and also the Jewish agency's behavior applying politics to the um, accepting of and the issuing of visas to people coming from Europe, a lot of followers of Jabotinsky, whether they were in the Beitar or the revisionist movement, were over were bypassed and they were overlooked. I mean, Vienna was had a nice Beitar, but Poland's had over 100,000 members. And unfortunately, most of them did not survive. Um, the, the tragedy was that uh, after the war, I mean, Jabotinsky died in 1940 in exile because the British would not allow him to be in Israel. And uh, after the war, you had many Beitarim going into the Irgun and helping with the evacuation and rescue of refugees and survivors of the Holocaust from Europe. But uh, unfortunately, the movement was not really sustained in a way like B'nai Kiva or Shomer Tzair or some of the other Zionist movements um, on, on were. And uh, so it, it really remained a very, very small shadow of itself afterwards. Uh, the most, I mean, the biggest thing of Beitar that one finds is the soccer team of Jerusalem. And that's, uh, and, and the uh, scattered memorials around the country. And it's sad. All right. Oh, somebody asked for the name of the book, and then I see they found it. But I did want to mention, by the way, that Israel generously donated a few boxes of the books to um, the ZOA. And um, when we have, uh, when we're back to live events, we will uh, be giving the uh, books out there. And so, thank you, Israel, for that. That was really wonderful of you. It's also, of course, a bit available on Amazon. And if you buy books on Amazon or anything on Amazon, washing machines, anything, please remember to name ZOA. Uh, as your charity and you know and buy them through Amazon Smile because we get a little uh, half of a percent then. Um, let's see. Okay, we also have a question from Joseph Levin. What was your father's perspective on the Elazarov affair, if he had if he had one? Oh, um, the thing is that uh, the Elazarov affair was unfortunately a well, just for those who may not be aware, Lazarov was a labor leader who was murdered while walking on the beach, in, I believe in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And um, even though, and, and, and this was a cause celebre that the left parties used to defame the followers of Jabotinsky um, who were later vindicated. But during the course of the trial, uh, um, uh, Stavsky and uh, and two other members were were put on trial, and um, they were they were uh, vindicated. They were found innocent, uh, as as 
although the person who perpetrated the murder was Arab, uh, I don't think that he was ever caught, but that my father was definitely very clear that murder was not a something that, uh, that, that the right would have been involved with, certainly not on a political level. I stress that because I, I, I understand that during the time of the underground, there were Jews who were betraying other Jews to the British um, and who may have had uh, met their fate otherwise. But as you know, for political reasons, murder was certainly not something that, uh, that uh, Jabotinsky's followers would, would countenance. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Um, could, could you uh, speak about the story about the Kotel now and you know how the British were, I mean, totally the Arabs were rioted in, in Jerusalem and they were complaining that during Rosh Hashanah and the conclusion of Yom Kippur, the shofar blowing was disturbing <clears throat> the services on the uh, Temple Mount. So the British decided to prohibit the blowing of the shofar. And um, in a show of Jewish defiance, uh, the members of the Beitar organized a group of people who would go to the Kotel and at the conclusion of Yom Kippur blow the shofar. Uh, and the British was very often simply arrest them and imprison them for six months for this public disturbance. Uh, in the last event in 1947, the Beitar pulled an interesting uh, stunt. They had an individual imitate the sound of the shofar. Remember the Kotel in those days was not what it looks like now. It was a very narrow alley. So this individual faked the sound from the far end when the British at the entrance were making their way towards the corner, they, the uh, Beit Harim started singing the national anthem, the Hatikva, which by protocol, the British had to stand at attention. In the meantime, the Beit Hari, who actually blew the real chauffeur was at the entrance. He did blow the chauffeur and got away before he could be apprehended. So the Plugata Kotel, which represented the people who successfully or unsuccessfully uh, blew the chauffeur and got away with it or didn't, uh, maintained the a group identity for many years after. And uh, my father was present during that uh, event with the Plugata Kotel blowing the chauffeur at the wall. And, uh, and have it, could you just- so You mentioned oh, go ahead. The, the airport, my dad had a cousin who was a soccer player and who, um, requested the clearing of a field in Yerushalayim to, uh, for a soccer field. And even though the dimensions that were being cleared of rocks was much larger than what would be needed for small aircraft, uh, rather, rather for, for soccer, the real intent was to provide the capability of uh, having an airfield in Jerusalem. And uh, this was subsequently used by Golda Meir to get to the city. Yeah, as well as other folks. And um, it was just another one of the ruses. I mean, those who visit Israel and have seen the underground bullet factory that was used by the, uh, by the Palmach, um, you know, it's really, there are a lot of similar stories where um, by necessity, the Jews of Israel who were disarmed by the British uh, needed to innovate, um, the, um, the circumstances to, to be able to protect themselves. So the airfield was just another such in, uh, story in the annals of those efforts. Um, the, uh, it, 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 we, we, it's hot. They say that people who are in the midst of a miracle don't recognize its magnitude. And I think that our generation is really blessed to be at a time when we have a state of Israel that's strong and independent, and um, and both a leader in every area of technology, of agriculture, of science, of water management. Israel is the only country on the planet that has more forests every year than the year before. Um, there are 200 nations that are going to Israel for advice on feeding their populations and, and developing water systems. 
I mean, you know, from a hundred years ago to today, uh, who would have imagined this? And peace treaties today with, with adversaries, you know, it, these are game changers. There was a time when no one would deal with Israel from the other side. I mean, and now, you know, the, the East is coming closer to Israel and the West is going, is becoming increasingly anti, anti-Semitic. It's um, what the Chinese would call very interesting times. Um, let's see, we had um, Steve uh, Feldman. Steve, did you want did you want to ask your question uh, live or I, or I could ask it? If you do want to ask it live, unmute yourself, but it's a, he's our uh, Philadelphia director. And he asked a very important question, which is, um, you know, maybe based on you know your father's teachings, uh, because your father worked with the youth so much. Uh, what can each of us do to get more young and not so young Jews, uh, whether in schools, schools, and elsewhere, to learn more about the Jabotinsky, about Jabotinsky, your father, Bitar, and other heroes, in addition to your book? And um, why, in your opinion, are they not taught about them? Okay. Um... That's, in my opinion, a very recognizing a very critical and underserved uh, need. Um, I believe that Jewish education is a vital part of our survival, and I think people have to undertake learning as a lifelong process. There is there is no lack of of wealth of information, but the issue is that. Um, What's what I'm looking for? Basically, fact-based evidence is something that has to be reintroduced. Everything today is coming across as spin. And, you know, people like to speak truth to power and they like to have their own truth. But the reality is people don't own the truth. The truth is the truth. If people don't like the truth and they want to, you know, present spin, it has to be called out. And it can only be called out by people who have the knowledge to call it out. And so the prerequisite is really just learning our history. You know, when you go to Israel with a Bible and you see the places where things took place yet thousands of years ago, you know, you don't really leave with an impression that you're not an indigenous member of the population. But for others who don't have that experience, they have to be shown that this is the case. Archeology span bears out so much of our history and it just needs to be presented to the public. So to answer your question, I think we have to have more events. Uh, we have to have opportunities to introduce the uninitiated to the beauties of Israel, to the richness and, and culture and contributions of the country to others. Um, I think that we need to celebrate it amongst ourselves more than it is. Um, I think that social media is a very, very overlooked area because I think if there were apps on Jewish history, apps on Jewish customs and personalities of, of uh, you know, I think that this would be enormous at spreading information to people. I think it's underused. One of the things that my father was always critical was Israel's, of, was Israel's Hasbara. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I know that we didn't get our message across and still don't very um, in, in the right sound bites. But I really feel that we get deplatformed a lot. We're not really even given a fighting chance in many arenas of public opinion, you know. And uh, I think that that's a very big challenge in itself. There are a lot of universities where people are just afraid, intimidated, harassed, uh, and uh, so dissociate themselves from Israel. And this has got to change. There's got to be a positive presence on campus to encourage identifying with Israel and supporting Israel. And uh, I think that that's what we need to focus on. We need to create these events. We need to invite people. We have to um, pro- you know, disseminate material uh, and, use, and use social media. I mean, that's where people are getting their news today. Uh, and the other thing is we need to write to political leaders and to, uh, and to uh, decision makers and voice our opinions. Because if, if they don't hear from us, then you can't expect to change their mind. Uh, and at least they should know that there is some pushback. There are people watching them. <clears throat> and ZOA, by the way, is a great group to do that with because they're on campus and they're running these programs. And we really need to get more people 
to come to them. We need to invite our friends. We need to invite uh, to get the word out in other circles because um, it's, I think that's how people, the, it, people's attention is drawn to these, uh, to these points. And thank you so much for also for mentioning ZOA's huge involvement in this. And um, you know, I do want to mention to everybody on the call that we have programs. And if you have a synagogue or school or uh, you know, religious school that you're affiliated with um, that would like to have one of our programs, um, you know, we would love to run it for them. Just let us know. Let you know. Let me know or let Alan Jay know. Um, and you know, we'll be there. You know, when we we've run programs like this for college students and with other organizations and so on. And we actually have a couple of upcoming programs. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Alan Jay for a minute so that Alan can tell you about uh, Guys, our uh, upcoming upcoming. Uh, an idiot in my whole life. Thank Alan? you, Liz. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I was just uh, taking care of a little bit of back end business. Uh, thank you for that. And before I make the announcement. <clears throat> I just want to thank Yisrael for a wonderful presentation. Yisrael, I hope uh, I'm not overburdening you. Your primary connection to your dad's experience makes you one of the best teachers there could be for this kind of education. So I hope that you take that response. I know you do, but I, I hope you continue to teach like you're doing today for us and don't let this uh, very important information go unheard. I know that kind of dovetails with what my colleague Steve Feldman uh, already asked, but uh, Kolha Kavo to you, we're really very much um, appreciative of the work that you're doing. We do have one uh, mega series, the Judea and Samaria mega series coming up. I, I put it in the chat uh, just to save the dates for now. We should be going out with a proper save the date in the next day or so. We're doing this event in conjunction again with Yesha Council and My Israel, two of the very prominent Zionist organizations in. Uh, Israel, with which ZOA works very, very closely. We're going to divide it into three uh, segments, Liz. One where we're going to talk about opportunities for Israel's future and what Judea and Samaria under Israel's sovereign rule represents in that plan. We're going to talk about, um, in one of the series, uh, the Palestinian plan actually to take over Area C. So that ought to be uh, kind of a challenging program. And uh, in the third program right now, it looks like we're going to talk about um, uh, movement by the Palestinians to destroy archaeological um, artifacts and um, thereby trying to disconnect, you know, Jew, Hebrew, Judaic uh, indigeneity in Judea and Samaria. We're going to address that very directly. The dates are uh, set now for uh, February 6th, 20th, and March 6th. And again, please do look for, um, please do look for a proper save the date and then register for that event. We're very excited. We'll announce who will be speaking. It won't only be a ZOA national president. Mort Klein will introduce at least one of the programs. Uh, it's very likely that we'll have heads of state, very influential politicians from both the United States and Israel. And uh, I would block out those Sunday mornings if I were you guys. It should be at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on those days. And again, Israel, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. It's my pleasure, and I really I thank you very much. Yashar Kochachem, keep up the great work, because you are one of the most visible and clearest um, and articulate representatives of our people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Israel. I also want to mention one upcoming event. Um, state is sort of tentative, but, but if you sign up, I'll let you know if it changes. Um, which will be on a book club event on February 23rd, 1 o'clock. Um, featuring author Scott Shea in his book, uh, Conspiracy You, about uh, professors who were teaching anti-Semitic conspiracy theories uh, on college campuses. And the link is, is in the chat uh, if you'd like to sign up for that. And we'll also be sending out um, you know, re registration, save the date forms too on that. Um, I, I really, could, do you have time for one more story to tell us about the Golda Meir? Uh, oh, so we, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, in her, uh, your father, uh, <laughs> you know, helping her uh, go to uh, to Russia to represent the the state of Israel when it was uh, newly uh, reconstituted. Right. Well, Golda Meir was, of course, born in Russia, and she very much uh, sought the role of Israel's ambassador to the Soviet Union, uh, to Russia. Uh, once the state was established and she campaigned very, very actively to get that appointment. 
and there was a lot of debate. Some members of labor were not excited about her being there, but uh, she prevailed. And when she went to, my, and my father was one of the team to brief her uh, about her role uh, in, in Russia. And my father, as the only religious member of the uh, group, came up with the idea of taking the pulse of Russian Jewry. After all, this was in the um, early 50s, I think it was 1950 or in 1949 when, this, when, when uh, Israel was sending its first ambassador there. And, we had, and, and Soviet Jewry was pretty much cut off from the world um, after the war, and certainly since in many cases since the revolution. So my father proposed to take the pulse of Jewish identification after years of communist suppression and oppression. And he suggested that Golda Meir make a visit to the Moscow synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. And to facilitate that, he got in touch with the president of the, um, the great synagogue in Tel Aviv to supply um, to, uh, the Torah and uh, Talesim and uh, Machzorim and Sidurim and Humashim. And all of these contributed religious articles were then sent to, to Moscow uh, from Israel as diplomatic, um, under diplomatic, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, diplomatic um, luggage so that the Soviets could not confiscate it and it was ensured to get to the synagogue. And so the shul would have what it needed for services. And in addition, my father started a whispering campaign in the streets of, of Moscow that Golda Meir would come to shul. And uh, as it turns out, uh, this, the Russians were blown away by the over 50,000 Jews who lined the streets from Golda Meir's hotel to the synagogue and accompanied her uh, there. And the Russians just were just totally taken by surprise at this outpouring of Jewish identification after such a long time of being in isolation. Uh, and uh, Golda Meir writes about it in her biography as well. And uh, this was really a, uh, a, a game changer in the sense that all of a sudden the Soviet jury was, was recognized as being still around and still, still uh, identifying. Um, and uh, it, it, my father was, was, that was one of the things that my father was also very proud about was to, the role he played in this uh, process. Um, it's, that, that, is that, that story was also in the book for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, hey, thank you, thank you. Amazing, we, uh, we have so many hidden gems. I mean, the Hasidic masters say that there are these sparks, Jewish sparks that are all over and you just never know what will ignite them. And, you know, when there is a Jewish opportunity, uh, the magnetism is there, the attraction is there, and it brings people out who you would never expect. There was, um, the, uh, Molotov's wife, Molotov was the uh, Russian who negotiated the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, accords between the Nazis and the communists. So his wife was Jewish. And uh, when they had a reception for Golda Meir, his wife went over to Golda and told her, Ich bin a Yiddish doctor, I'm a Jewish daughter. So uh, Golda Meir smiled. Shortly after that event, uh, Mrs. Ribbentrop was sent to a gulag and she was not heard of until after the passing of Joseph Stalin, at which point her husband uh, pulled strings and got back together again with her. But uh, it shows you the extent of, uh, of the animosity towards it Jews and how risky it was. You know, another story that's in the book is how when my father received the Russians ambassador, the first thing they did when they walked into their suite at the hotel was to check for bugs. They went all around <laughs> microphones. And he contrasted that with the, the arrival of uh, James McDonald, who was the American ambassador 
who arrived in Israel with a very positive, unsuspicious, but warm and friendly manner, and introduced his daughter who spoke Hebrew, and the totally tremendous contrast between the two. So uh, again, my father was fortunate to live through interesting times. We are fortunate that uh, he was, what do you call, persuaded to record them. And uh, I found I find this both uh, gratifying and entertaining to revisit from time to time because it does uh, reconnect me with uh, with my father and with uh, events that affected our people so much in the not so distant past. He was, he was certainly an inspiration to all of us, and uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing so much about the book with us. I really appreciate it. Um, I, by the way, one, one of the people in the chat, uh, Michael Ranan, wrote, my, my parents knew Dr. Hakoen in the U.S. I have a picture of him here with uh, here from the Jabotinsky Centennial Dinner in November 1980, which uh, they also attended, which is nice to see. And you have a lot of other uh, comments thanking you for this wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you very much. You're very um, kind. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, please, uh, you know, contribute to ZOA so we continue our important work, uh, ZOA.org, and um, have a wonderful week, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events. Thank you.